for me to be bestowed upon this important responsibility of uh, hosting uh, the important uh, event of IAGS. IAGS is taking strides in various academic program. It had another initiative on bringing the legends to you so that you proceed with legendary thoughts towards a legendary life. This is the idea of having this program. So we are poised to hear two important senior most surgical fraternity and endoscopic fraternity of this part of the country and our neighboring friendly country, Japan. For that, we have met today at this evening important time. So yeah, I'm happy to host this important program, IAGS Prime Time. May I request our president, Dr. Raman Goyal, to formally inaugurate the program. Good evening, friends. Uh, it's really a proud moment because IAGS is starting another major activity. And this is not actually a webinar. That's why we are calling it a IAGS prime time. This, this particular activity is being brought specifically to ensure that we hear from the seniors. And this has got two components. So in the first half, we will have a master who has pioneered a technique. And we are looking forward to see not the technique alone, but we are looking to hear his experience of hundreds and thousands of procedures that he has done, because that is what matters more once you have once you have learned the basics of a technique. So I'm honored that Professor Ino from Japan has joined us. And especially because it's a very odd hour for him, it's a morning in Japan, and he has agreed to be a part of this activity. So IAGS is really obliged for his presence. In the second half of the meeting, we have our founder president, Professor Udwadia, who is sharing his moments, the critical moments in his life, how he thought surgical practice should evolve. And this, this component will have always have a legend who will be talking about how they changed, how they shaped surgical practice in their own countries, in the region and across the world. And you, you know, this is a matter of personal, uh, personal pride for me that I got an opportunity to interview him. I have been in surgical practice for 33 years. I've been in Mumbai for 30 years. But those 40 minutes that I spent with Professor Dwadia have proven to be a turning point in my life. Because they have, they have defined how things should go ahead in next 10, 20, 30 years that I practice surgery, COVID permitting. So I'm very happy that Dr. Kanagwil, who gave this idea of IAGS Prime to us, and we re readily accepted that, is ultimately coming to fruition. And we will have this fortnightly event where each time we'll be bringing the legends in surgery to you. So I'm very happy to inaugurate it on behalf of the executive committee of IAGS today. And I hand it over to Dr. Kanagwil to take charge and to start the academic activity today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It's indeed a privilege for me, uh, bestowed upon by the IAGS and the executive committee. I will thank the executive committee and the President for having trust on me, and uh, I'm indeed uh, pr pride to having uh, take a lot of uh, pride and stride to introduce Professor Ino. I would like to put on official record that the Heller's myotomy was first mentioned or first published as early as 1913. Almost it stood strong for close to 100 years or close to a century, and it was Professor Ino who strongly believed a surgery can be avoided for treating achalasia of the cardiac. Professor Ino has been trained at the most important centers in Japan, and he has been associated with the single institution for the past four decades, and is currently the president of the Japanese Gastroenterological Endoscopy Society. In fact, Professor Ino 
has now moved on from teaching the techniques of uh, achalasia poem procedure to looking upon the lacunae of the poem procedure in fact he has very recently published the issues of reflex and how to do a endoscopic anti reflex procedure along with poem procedure and then he also has innovated third space endoscopy into the chest and to his hands he also has published a large series multi center series for rectifying patients who have recurrence after laparoscopic hellas myotomy and a huge combination of thousands of permutations and combinations of troubled achalasia patients are being relieved by his standardization of technique in fact he regularly conducts the courses for the american society of gastrointestinal endoscopy the middle east surgeons and he always has a handful of fellows who work with him for a period of one or two years to learn this procedure and they are go on to propagate the technique of poem in fact the iags is very honored to have the presence of professor haru you know amidst us and we are waiting to listen to your wisdom sir over to professor ino hello can you hear me very well sir uh -huh. so good evening uh, all the uh, indian colleagues and the, uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction for me and i also appreciate the uh, dr uh, laman go um for your kind invitation to this uh, um uh, important workshop so uh, i would like to share my slides okay Okay. Oh, 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 okay. Okay. So, um, this is my uh, uh, COI, and then we published our procedure, um, Journal of Endoscopy, in uh, 2010, 12, uh, 10 years ago. The procedure itself like this. So creates a submucosal tunnel and the um, place the, the sacral myotomy in a submucosal tunnel. So please note the date of the procedure. So 2008, this is the uh, uh, world first case uh, of poem. Uh, after submucosal in incision, uh, uh, injection, we place the mucosal incision in the anterior wall of the esophagus. So getting in after creating a submucosal so working space, um, now we started a uh, circular myotomy in this case. So uh, we have already completed anterior short myotomy in this case. <clears throat> Then we close the mucosal entry using clips. Uh, junction is open like this. So, uh, of course, um, we we uh, select selected the uh, um, mild acarasia patient in the first case. And the procedure, and uh, this is a volume swallow before and after procedure. Very uh, smooth. Passage of a uh, volume. Um, this is a memorable shot at the time of a third case of a poem procedure. So anyway, uh, the first case, uh, the symptom, uh, this is the uh, Eckhart score improved very well. And the, uh, uh, I met uh, with this patient eight years after procedure. So he is uh, totally fine and he can eat well and the patient satisfaction with a hundred percent, no good symptom. Uh, after this procedure, so far we performed more than in our hospital, 2,200 uh, cases. Um, we published the data uh, at the time over 500 uh, to American College of Surgeon. 
So first, I'd like to uh, mention about the myotomy rings. Uh, for type 1 achalasia, classical achalasia, we can place the uh, short myotomy. Short myotomy, the 5 to 7 centimeter myotomy, that is the, uh, very similar to um, surgical myotomy. Yes, like this. And in the case of a vigorous achalasia, we have to place a, a longer myotomy. So uh, in the point procedure, proximal extension of the myotomy um, uh, earlier um, is a very easy. So uh, we can place uh, the long myotomy. So this is a myotomy rings based upon the Chicago classification, uh, but it's a, it looks a little bit complicated. Then uh, from the uh, uh, treatment point of view, you, uh, we can summarize uh, three categories. So in the uh, Chicago, Chicago type one, type two, we can place a uh, uh, LES myotomy. And for vigorous acrasia, Chicago type three, so we uh, place a body plus LES myotomy. And in the case of a diffuse spasm and jackhammer esophagus, uh, we place uh, the selected myotomy to esophageal body. Uh, so LES uh, preserved. So Dr. Caridas and Dr. Pandolfino uh, from Chicago, uh, they uh, uh, reported the usefulness of the poem uh, to particularly to Chicago classification type three. Uh, of course, we can apply poem to uh, type one, type two and the uh, outflow distraction. Poem can be applied uh, to your spastic motility disorders very well. Um, uh, some reports demonstrate a very good results. This is a case of a diffuse esophageal spasm. So before procedure, uh, left side, you can see um, it's a very strong um, a sp spastic contraction. And then after point procedure, we place a long myotomy and the volume uh, goes uh, very smoothly. So in this case, uh, we can confirm the normal LES function. So in this case, we preserve the lower esophageal sphincter. So this is the uh, uh, endoscopic view of this case before procedure. We can recognize the uh, lots of abnormal contractions, uh, esophageal body, and the uh, light side, you can see a divert from. Anyway, so in this case, uh, in a posterior uh, wall, we place the uh, submucosal tunnel and the and now we perform the uh, double scope check. Anyway, so uh, we place the uh, circular mountain. In this, uh, like this, the uh, uh, diffuse spasm or jacama patients, uh, mostly the muscle layer is usually very thick. Then we place, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, distal end of the submucosal tunnel. You can see a thin muscle layer. That is a lower esophageal sphincter muscle. Then uh, we preserve the, uh, uh, this one. This is the uh, uh, starting point of the lower esophageal sphincter. Then we preserve this uh, LES. Okay, the proximal part has uh, a thick muscle area has already been dissected. Okay, so in this case, uh, um, symptom score improvement is dramatically well, nine to zero. Um, recent publications of the poem procedure, um, so like this, uh, any, any institution, the success rate is very high, 92 to 100% success rate, but potential problem of the poem is the uh, post poem GERD. Uh, 20 to 50%. So, um, how to avoid the postponed GERD? That would be a um, uh, very, very important issue for us. So, a uh, simple method, I re we recommend a double scope method at the time of the procedure. 
control the gas required in lengths to uh, two centimeter. Uh, we insert the two scopes. Uh, um, so procedure is like this. This procedure was uh, first reported uh, from uh, Portuguese doctors. And then the uh, uh, mother scope in the submucosa layer and the uh, submucosa tunnel. And the uh, another uh, monitor scope is inserted in the stomach. And then, so like this, uh, we can confirm the uh, light uh, passing through the uh, mucosa layer uh, in a gastric caldera. So uh, we can control the uh, gastric myotomy rings uh, less than two centimeter. So uh, this was uh, uh, already published in a, a guideline. Uh, you can uh, read lead it. Um, so one of the uh, uh, LCT uh, reported um, gastric myotomy length is a uh, more than uh, uh, three centimeter. It causes the uh, severe reflux esophagitis after foreign procedure potentially. So uh, it's better to control the uh, gastric myotomy rings uh, less than two centimeter. So another another uh, technique is a poem plus multiplication. So this is the uh, uh, recreate of the helado procedure surgery endoscopically. Uh, Doctor Akiko Toshimori. So uh, she supported. Uh, uh, this procedure very well, one of my colleagues. Anyway, so uh, this is the first case of a poem plus multiplication. This was uh, three years ago. Um, so far, we performed this procedure in uh, 43 cases. Okay, so this is actual procedure. Um, we place the anterior myotomy uh, and then after completion of a, a poem procedure, uh, at the distal end of the submucosal tunnel, we, uh, we cut the peritoneum and uh, get in the uh, uh, abdominal cavity and we place the uh, distal anchor and the proximal anchor. And then after that, we uh, pull the gastric funders to the uh, uh, place of the abdominal esophagus. Um, we performed a live demonstration of this procedure um, in the uh, uh, at the time of ESGE days uh, last year uh, in Prague. So this is the uh, um, um, uh, the demonstration at the uh, venue, and you can see a fan flication already done. Um, we utilize uh, the endoscopic hand suturing device uh, for this procedure. Um, Vlog, uh, that everybody knows well, and the, this is a hand suturing device, and I like this. After getting the abdominal cavity, uh, we place the uh, distal anchor. Uh, on the anterior wall of the stomach. And then at this time we place a project and then uh, we place a, a proximal anchoring like this and the, uh, normally place two stitches. So action procedure, this is the uh, submucosal tunnel and then um, we cut the peritoneum so behind you can see a back side of the left liver lobe. Once again, this is very important. So cut the peritoneum. And then uh, we open the peritoneum window. Uh, of course, uh, we insufflate a CO2 through the endoscope. And then uh, get in abdominal cavity. The top is the back side of the abdominal wall and the bottom is a uh, anterior wall of the stomach. And we place the uh, uh, stitch 
like this. So this is a, a intragastric monitoring. Uh, needle is uh, coming in the stomach, in the out. Uh, the also, we can recognize open hiatus. Uh, so, okay. This is a proximal uh, placement of the uh, second stitch. Like this. Okay. Needle is coming. And then uh, you can see uh, in the gastric scope, we can uh, recognize a very nice fund application. So this fund endoscopy image of the fund this image is very similar uh, to um, after dough fund application. So this is a clinical results in uh, 43 cases. Um, technically, we completed this procedure 100%. Um, um, this is a 24 hour pH. Um, ah, yes, so Domista composite score in the control group poem alone is like this. And the, in the case of a poem plus fund application group, um, composite score improved uh, stati statistically difference. Uh, now we think like this. So, um, of course, the uh, Nissan fund application is a strong, strongest fund application. Anti reflux effect is very strong. And the uh, Tupé and the Dole is a mild, very mild. And the POMF is a very similar to Dole. And the another procedure is AMA. But uh, today uh, we have no time to talk about the AMA procedure. So, uh, our treatment strategy for achalasia is like this. In the case of uh, uh, achalasia, we, uh, we perform the regular poem procedure, a uh, poem alone, uh, and then uh, posterior uh, myotomy. We, we standardly do it. And the, it's very, very rare, but less than 1%, um, some patient becomes a refractory GERD, then we place a paroral endoscopic fund application in anterior wall. It, it's a, a dough fund application. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Eno. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I believe I have, we gave a very short uh, time for you to give your uh, important outcomes of the lifetime uh, perfection of a specific technique. Um, uh, we have a few questions from the floor, uh, Professor Eno. Can I ask you those questions? Yes, of course. Yes. Welcome. Uh, Professor Eno, uh, you have been doing this procedure for more than two decades now, this poem procedure. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, how long is your longest follow up after poem procedure? And do you find the outcome any different from a laparoscopic procedure? Uh -huh. So, um, um, after introduction of the poem procedure, <laughs> We have only one Herado procedure, honestly, last, last 12 years. First case was the 2008. After that, so all the, all the cases in our know, hospital, except one case, <laughs> uh, we did the poem. So uh, we, don't, we don't perform, we didn't perform the, we have never performed the RCT in a poem versus the, um, Herado procedure, um, but uh, our results of the poem, not bad. The only potential problem is the postpone GERD. Uh, honestly, um, as I mentioned, and our data demonstrate, uh, we, we don't have, we don't have very, uh, not so many severe GERD patient. Uh, among 2,000 patients, only two cases received the anti-reflux procedure, uh, anti-reflux surgery. Mm -hmm. So 0.1% uh, 
percent of the poem patient receives the uh, um, anti-reflux procedure. So, and um, that is the uh, um, um, negative factor of the poem procedure. Very small percentage patient, but becomes a severe reflux. And the uh, positive point of view, um, poem, that is a major advantage for a vigorous acarasia or uh, other um, uh, motility disorders of the soft body, uh, particularly a diffuse spasm and the uh, jackhammer, nuts, cracker, esophagus, like that. So um, I think uh, um, poem is uh, uh, um, well accepted. A procedure uh, to uh, all the uh, surgeons uh, as well. Um, same to our gastroenterologist. Thank you, Professor Ino. Uh, the next question is, uh, Professor Ino, you have been doing myotomy for achalasia procedure. Uh, in bariatric procedure, especially mm -hmm. when there is sleeve fibrosis or a pouch fibrosis, can your procedure be of use to handle these problems? Do you have any experience in dealing with this? Yeah, well, once again, so your question is uh, um, our scar formation after this procedure? Yes, uh, actually, after sleeve procedure for a bariatric surgery, uh -huh. if there is a stenosis of the remnant stomach, uh -huh. Especially when I, I believe the surgeon has made a very narrow sleeve. Mm -hmm. So patient is having dysphagia post sleeve gastrectomy. Uh -huh. So he would like to know before going for a laparoscopic revision, can this OM procedure be extended towards the length of the entire stomach so that that gives relief to the patient's dysphagia post sleeve gastrectomy procedure? I, I, I'm sorry, I can follow your question. So uh, once again, so uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Eno, I know, I know the three. Professor Eno, yes, Dr. Raman Gold is a very senior yeah. bariatric surgeon. I will yeah. ask him to phrase the question for you, Dr. Raman, please. Yeah. No, so Professor Eno, you know, this is not about the poem for Ecclesia. Ah. What Dr. Kanagwell is asking is that if after a a sleeve gastrectomy in bariatric, if there is yeah. a sister, can that be relieved? Uh, a submucous dissection myotomy can be done endoscopic, uh -huh. endoscopically for stomach strictures. Ah, okay. Now I understand your question. <laughs> so, uh, application of the submucous uh, myotomy uh, to the stenosis after. Um, sleeve gastrectomy, you mean? Yes. So uh, I think theoretically, theoretically, may uh, yes, we can apply. But I myself am not. Uh, um, um, I I never performed the uh, sleeve gastrectomy. Yeah. I mean, so because in Japan, uh, of course, you know, we don't have not so many <laughs> obese patients in Japan. Anyway, so I, I'm surgeon, I'm a substitute surgeon, but I myself don't perform the uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So I have no experience myself, so I cannot answer it. Thank you, Thank you Professor Reno. The next question from one of the surgeons is, would you like to share your insights uh, and experience in use of POEM procedure in Pediatric achalasia. Uh -huh. So it's a very, very good question. Very, very important question. So um, our youngest patient is a three year old, three year old. And the um, uh, less uh, pediatric patient, uh, age of uh, less than uh, 15 year old, uh, we have uh, roughly 30 cases we did it. And the uh, we complete the procedure, and the uh, result is not bad. But so we have to be very careful. Oh, so young uh, pediatric acarasia patients, some of them is at the congenital congenital stenosis of the esophagus. So we have uh, six cases so far among two thousand. So 
Uh, they are characteristic uh, that looks very similar to achalasia, but um, uh, they have um, so congenital achalasia, uh, achalasia uh, congenital stenosis of the surface. So uh, in such a case, so performing the poem procedure is a very difficult. We can do it. We can do it, but uh, not easy. Not easy. Um, like. Uh, um, in a submucosal space, uh, we can see a uh, lots of uh, fibrosis, severe fibrosis. So it's uh, very difficult to dissect in a submucosal space. Anyway, in such a case, we uh, try to perform the point procedure, um, but it's a uh, very uh, technically uh, demanding. So, um, uh, please uh, let you know uh, the in some. Pediatric patient, uh, they have the uh, disease of the uh, uh, congenital stenosis, not achalasia. But so uh, uh, in the case of achalasia patients, so we can apply for him anyway. Thank you, Professor. You know, there is yet another question. Uh, a patient who has the laparoscopic hairless cardiomyotomy. Uh -huh. Uh, who possibly had a, a, a type of fund application, but he has not mentioned. But he says post myotomy, after a year long treatment with proton pump inhibitor and prokinetics, patient continues to have severe reflux. Uh -huh. Do you have any experience in performing the poem assisted fund application in these type of lapros post laparoscopic patients coming with reflux, symptomatic reflux? Ha ha. So, okay. So your question is the application of the uh, poem like um, uh, um, po submucosal um, approach, and then I make a fund application uh, in yes. the case of a post post hair doll. Yes. Post hair doll, good. Yes. So, sir. so, so post hair doll, good. Um, it's a very difficult to, uh, it's a very important, very important, but post poem failure, failure of a uh, hair dog, uh, is a very good candidate for poem, but the uh, post hair dog GERD, uh, it's a very difficult to control it. So, of course, you know, um, post hair dog patient. That means that means the patient had had the achalasia. So, it's after clearance is a non nil, and the also severe reflux. So it's a very difficult to manage it. In the case of uh, in, um, of course a PPI PPI or PCAB is a, a best uh, um, a treatment for them. But uh, if it's not enough to control the reflux. Uh, at the time, is a, uh, I'm not sure about the uh, at the time, so uh, one of the choices is vasectomy. We cannot control it. So, for example, if we apply the anti reflux mucosal ablation in such a case, uh, but some patient uh, recur the symptom of the stenosis, so another problem. So. Uh, it's a very difficult to handle it. Uh, question is very important. Good question, but the answer is very difficult. Thank you, Professor Eno. The last question for you for this evening. Uh, Professor Eno, now we are using POEM procedure for proximal achalasias as well. We are mm -hmm. using POEM procedure for handling di esophageal diverticula. We have extended myotomy for gastric poem. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the learning curve, is it mandatory for the newer procedures also? Or one is proficient for doing a poem for achalasia, can attempt to do the next level of procedures. Please guide us. Uh -huh. So, um, poem. Po so, um, um, Today, the uh, <coughs> all of you are laparoscopic surgeon, and the uh, among the endoscopic procedures, uh, compared to uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection, ESD, 
poem procedure is a technically easy. And the, if you are a surgeon, I, I myself, a surgeon surgeon, I perform a spadectomy on the uh, nissen fund application, some other the gastric surgery as well, laparoscopic, total gastrectomy, uh, everything we do. Um, my, my, I myself do it. So like, like class surgeon, uh, we know the anatomy very well. So uh, we can perform the uh, poem procedure. Uh, endoscopic uh, handling technique is not so um, difficult, I think. And the uh, poem is the first step. And the second step uh, is a uh, uh, G poem, gastric poem for uh, gastric paralysis. Is a uh, uh, technically is the same, technically same. Not so difficult like uh, ESD in the yeah, uh, duodenum and the colon, it's a very uh, technically demanding, but the poem and the G poem is uh, not so difficult, I think. Uh, if you are a good uh, flexible endoscopic surgeon. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Edo. One of our uh, past presidents, Professor Abe Delvi, has uh, asked a question. Sir, uh, you have devised guidelines for the learning curve of poem procedure. How many procedures? Yes, a surgeon have to minimum do it before technically becoming independent to do a point. So uh, it's a, it's a, yes, it's a, it's also a good question. So um, so um, of course everybody perform a surgical procedures uh, usually. Uh, but it's a depends on the um, the doctor. He can he 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 or a C uh, is um, um, uh, how much procedures uh, using a flexible endoscopy. If uh, the surgeon performs the uh, flexible endoscopy, as uh, what I mean, uh, upper GI endoscopy, coronoscopy, and the uh, uh, looking me, and so you are very familiar with uh, handling the uh, flexible endoscope. So, um, poem procedure is not difficult, I think. So, um, but if uh, you are so far, so far in your career, you just perform the um, uh, laparoscopic and the tracoscopic surgery alone uh, without using the flexible endoscope, no, no carrier of a uh, flexible endoscopic surgery. So it's uh, uh, technically a little bit difficult. Anyway, anyway, um, learning curve is a 30 cases, I think. So it's the same to any other surgical procedure. So 30 cases, uh, we have uh, some um, level of our, um, surgical step, technical step going up to the level plateau. So. Thank you, Professor. Last question is, uh, Professor, the poem has taken away the laparoscopic hairless procedure from the surgeon to the endoscopist. Mm -hmm. Your innovation of poem F, the poem assisted fund application, uh -huh. do you think that will also be taken away from the surgeon to the endoscopist? Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I, I think that is a very uh, important point. So I think I think uh, some surgical procedure um, can be done by flexible endoscope. So it's a so if laparoscopic surgery is a minimally invasive surgery, I think so. This uh, flexible endoscopic intraluminal approach is a really it's a notes procedure. So natural orifice trans, uh, transgenal endoscopic surgery. So this is a least invasive procedure, I think. But but it uh, depends. <laughs> so um, myotomy and the uh, dolphin application, it's a relatively simple surgical procedure. So we can do it uh, flexible, using flexible endoscope, I think. But so other procedures is at this moment, is a, I, I think a laparoscopic approach is much, much better. Thank you, Professor uh, Ino, for uh, staying so late in the night. It is close to 1.30 a.m. in Japan. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
and uh, the questions are going to be endless because our surgeons are very very happy to have you and listen to you we would like you to invite for a longer talk at a later point of time with the president president's permission uh, we are very much honored to have you to uh, have you listen to your talk and taking all the questions even at a very late hour in japan thank you professor you know i now request our president dr raman goel to formally thank you thank you very much it's thank my you. honor you know that was that was a wonderful talk uh, enlightening and we have a lot of surgeons in india who do flexible endoscopies so uh -huh. i know uh, they will be happy to to take it up and uh, the, many of them are actually doing started doing poem so uh -huh. i'm sure this is this is will be interesting and we'll invite you to uh demonstrate uh, uh, a poem with fundoplication or fundoplication at one of our conferences thank you so much good night thank you thank you very much yeah. okay. have a good evening thank you professor eno thank you uh, please uh, sign off bye, bye. it is very late thank you for staying with us please feel free to sign off thank you thank you now uh, uh, we move on to the next important agenda for the evening in fact legends are not made overnight it is a legendary effort of their lifetime which makes them legendary to be accepted as a legend by the society is not an easy task or you cannot enforce the society to call as a legend it is consistent effort with absolute clarity of vision one need to work from the beginning part of their career to be called as a legend now in fact the ultimate pride and pleasure for me is to introduce professor tahemden irak udwadia in fact most of us revere him as a godly figure who has brought in the science of laparoscopic surgery to india most of the important newer technological innovation is quite costly not reachable and very few surgeons end up doing it but professor udwadia brought in the technology of laparoscopy into the country into a government teaching hospital and later ensured the technique and the technology of laparoscopy reaches the surgeon who works at the most remote part of the country and he made the platform very strong for the surgeons to migrate from basic laparoscopy to advanced laparoscopy at various levels possible in fact we never had a second choice to have a legend to talk to us and in fact when we requested professor woodwardia was very kind enough and he immediately agreed and more so i think this is one of the first or i think it is the first physical interaction which professor woodwardia has had during this covid era and uh, it is none other than our president dr raman goel took the privilege to interview professor Udwadia sir, and in fact, many life-changing answers have been given by Udwadia. Let us all listen to his wisdom. Nitin, can we have the video on? and then you realize that the person whom you are interviewing today has reached to such great heights that you you feel so small on one side and you see, look up at him and see what is possible or what is feasible i am absolutely honored to be in company of a person who as a surgeon has achieved practically everything in his lifetime when i say everything it means 
ट्रेनिंग प्रोफेशनल ट्रेनिंग प्रोफेशनल ऑनर्स एंड सिविलियन ऑनर्स आई मीन टू से a gentleman who has been trained in india who went to uk to do his fellowship frcs in royal college of edinburgh and royal college of england who came back to india and started teaching surgeons in india in medical college grand medical college in mumbai who was subsequently honored by the highest medical award in india the bc roy award and then he got padma shri in 2006 and subsequently honored by padam bhushan in 2017 not only that he was also been honored by obe order of british empire by queen elizabeth ii i think it's probably the only he is not probably the only surgeon from india who has got so many awards and recognition for his work and obviously i'm sure you have guessed it right i am talking of professor tamton eric udwadia who is also the founder president of iags the indian association of gastrointestinal endosurgeons professor udwadia has been honored by so many associations that it's impossible to to list all those honors in next 30 to 40 minutes of the interview time that i have been given he had been president of elsa the society of endoscopic and laparoscopic surgeons of uh, asia he has been president of international federation of societies endoscopic societies ifsis in past and has been honored with fellowship of american college of surgeons so it's a absolute pleasure and honor to interview him today as the as i took over iags i thought is the time to to make sure that we know his thoughts his ideas and his vision and we maintain it for our record of iags deeply honored to to have professor udwadia with us today and i would like to hear your thoughts sir and i am so honored that you you agreed for to meet us during this covid pandemic time for a one to one interview raman i can assure you the honor is mine I can also assure you that all the things you said are perhaps inflated, and I'm basically just an average, run-of-the-mill surgeon. Like all other surgeons in India, I have no special qualifications, and I am happy to be just one of Indian surgeons. So, sir, uh, you know, to start with, uh, when I was going through your bio data, I realized that you have been trained as surgeon in India, then you you did your training in UK. and then you came back and trained so many thousands of surgeons in india how do you how do you see difference in training surgical training in india and uk and uh, how that can be improved if there are any lacunas in india i was very fortunate in my training in india because the work professor said and he had i was his thoracic surgery registrar and his general surgery registrar and he had the dog lab where i was uh, the icmr fellow for several years so that with the training i had in india was a very thorough training and when i went to england i felt confident that i all needed to do was to just pass my exam and if i got a job i would do it as well as any other british surgeon i was very lucky to get a job because in the early 60s they were not giving jobs freely in uh, england and somehow thanks to professor sales contacts i managed to become a registrar to a teaching hospital in liverpool royal liverpool uh, without even applying for the job and i found that there was a definite difference in the treatment the training in england in terms of patient care was far more meticulous for the simple reason that the volume of patients in india is so vast that the houseman is literally over overloaded with work and has no time for niceties he has no time for research he has no time for reading whereas there there was ample time for the national health was relaxed and they had took a certain number of patients certain number of operations and everything else was on the waiting list as india we tried to keep the waiting list as low as possible because the patient was off work and needed to work 
And uh, I would say that for a surgeon, primary training should always be in India because the volume of work, the amount of practice he gets, the experience he gets, he would never get in any other part of the world. And if he's fortunate to have a good training center like BTAM or any good training center, there's nothing better for surgical education than to work in India. People think that when you uh, when you have achieved so much in life, you 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 have been a successful person. But I am sure you have also gone through your period of struggle. So, what is your your thoughts about uh, how can you uh, advise those who are struggling surgeons, young surgeons today, and what is the role of working in a teaching institution on on evolution of a person as a surgeon? I returned from England in 1963 and my only attachment was to the JJ Hospital as an honorary assistant professor, to the Wadia Children's Hospital as an honorary assistant pediatric surgeon and to the KM Hospital as a surgical research fellow. In other words, I had only free hospitals attachments, I had no private hospital attachment. So my work in terms of earning was very poor. I used to sit in my consulting rooms and for many, for the first two years, all I would do was read surgery, write articles, uh, write review papers and the sort. The next one year, I was so fed up that I stopped reading surgery and started reading books like uh, Oscar Wilde and uh, Shakespeare and other books. And in the fourth year, I was so fed up that I wouldn't read anything at all. It took a long time for me to get an attachment to the Pasigen Hospital, the Breach Candy Hospital. And it was only in 1967 that I really started earning money. During that period, I was severely frustrated in terms of income, but I was so greatly satisfied by the volume of work I was doing at the JJ Hospital, at the Pastor General, at the uh, Wadia Children's Hospital, and in the dog lab at the KEM where we had started the heart transplant program, that surgically I was fully satisfied. I think the important thing to do when you come back is to make sure that you are attached to someone or some unit which can give you surgical satisfaction. If your surgical satisfaction it is not important to have monetary satisfaction because you will always have enough to put food on the table and have a, a roof over your head. And gradually you will be surprised that if you resist the temptation of cutting corners, if you resist the temptation of split practice, if you resist the temptation of running down your colleagues, then ultimately you get a practice which is based on patience. Your patients start sending you patients. And that is a practice which snowballs. It just goes on increasing in volume even till today. And that is a practice no GP can ever take away from you. So I would request that you stand firm to your convictions and you are bound to make good because your work will speak for itself. And whilst you're waiting and process of frustration, try and get doing surgery with someone, assisting surgery, going for free assistance, whatever it is, asking for an attachment, honorary attachment to any hospital, even if it's not a teaching hospital. And I can tell you that the ultimate way to grow in surgery is to be in a teaching hospital. Because in a teaching hospital, you don't teach. In a teaching hospital, you learn. And the amount of learning you get in a teaching hospital is amazing. Your residents are teaching you, your students are teaching you, your patients are teaching you. And in India, the volume of work, I mean, we had 20 allotted beds at JJ Hospital in my unit. It was a tertiary care hepatobiliary unit. And at any one time, we had over 80 patients in the ward, on the floor, between the beds, under the beds. So teaching hospital, at that time at least, was a unique experience for any surgeon. So sometime in your career, sir, 
you you thought of laparoscopy as a game changer or did you think about it as a game changer or did you think just as an addition to your general surgical practice so what made you think of laparoscopy as an addition to open surgical work you see at jj hospital as i told you we had about 80 patients at any time and the infrastructure was so poor that a baby meal would take 3 weeks to materialize and the log our waiting period was so long that uh, it was causing the backlog i was lucky to see a gynecologist doing a diagnostic laparoscopy gynec laparoscopy and i requested if i could look into the telescope and dr montasha was doing it and i raised the head end of the bed reverse and i was amazed at the clarity the the clear vision i could get and then i realized that if i had a laparoscope our diagnosis of patients would improve so fast that we could have a rapid turnover and we make a very efficient ward and that is why we went to at that time medical instruments had a duty of 360% import duty hence i went to germany got the laparoscopic equipment smuggled it in the between the sarees of my wife and came to india and i know conscience biting me because i was using it only for poor patients in a teaching hospital and the rapidity with which we could have a transformation in the bed turnover was amazing and we had a tertiary hepatobiliary unit and we could do full justice to all the patients that were referred to us that is how laparoscopy came in india not as a tribute to western technology but to have early diagnosis in poor patients in a teaching hospital so from the diagnostic laparoscopy did you ever visualize that we will be going in such advanced laparoscopic surgeries now the, the oncological surgeries bariatric surgeries did you ever thought of it at that time you see uh, in 1972 and all through 70s we were just so happy doing diagnostic laparoscopy and we used to go to rural india where there had no ultrasound no investigative and the surgeons in rural india already had laparoscopes because they were doing sterilization so they took up diagnostic laparoscopy in rural areas very rapidly and then we we realized that there could be a future for laparoscopic surgery and when the initial laparoscopic cholecystectomy was described we immediately felt that with over 3000 diagnostic laparoscopy behind us we were in a position to move into laparoscopic operative surgery we got the equipment in march my team at jj and i worked with it for 6 weeks on a trainer i made out of a plastic box and we were happy to do the first laparoscopic appendectomy laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the developing world and people do need the credit for doing the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy but let me make it very strong and clear that the credit goes to the whole team the whole surgical team of board 19 days the residents the interns the nurses and the theater nurses and anesthetists of the hospital So here is a person who is the question of uh, work life balance work family balance and also the fitness of the surgeon uh, i know that you have been a sportsman throughout your life so how does a surgeon keep himself fit how much time should he give to his family how does he give that time to the family and how much time to the to work because this is very commonly discussed issues now that how to maintain a work family and uh, life balance true this is one of the greatest problems in the personal life of every surgeon because a surgeon basically has an ego has a trust to move forward that's the makeup of any surgeon and this trust often makes sure that his family is neglected 
Uh, I am guilty of that because very often I would leave the house before the children woke up and I'd come back after they'd gone to sleep. And that is not the way of good parenting. Fortunately, I have a wife who made up for my absence and that did the work of two parents and brought up the children happily. But I am remiss in that I was negligent in the family issue. However, I, every Saturday, Sunday, I would make sure I had time for the family. We'd go out for picnics, even if it was to hanging up or to Jew. Every Saturday, Sunday, I'd make family time. In terms of fitness, I think uh, if you've been a sportsman from your school days, you have the inborn desire to remain fit. I have a small gym at my house with a treadmill, few weights, elastic bands, which I needed for my physiotherapy after my shoulder replacement. And I try and keep fit. I used to play squash up till I was 35. Then I had a knee problem, so I switched over to golf. And for the last 50 years, I play golf as often as I can. There is a saying, that if golf interferes with work, give up work. But we can't often do that. But I can happily say that next week, this week, this weekend, I'm starting golf after four months. So some form of activity and some form of exchange, physical exchange, is an essential part of growing up happily. And my golf distance has not decreased over years. At the last All India uh, Medical Golf Tournament, I got the second prize for the longest drive. In this materialistic world, a lot of frustration comes from expectations. Uh, we are, uh, as doctors and as surgeons especially, we are in a great hurry to to be at par with a software engineer or we are at, we want to be at par with a, with a other specialists who are doing better than us. So what is the role of competition between, uh, between specialties or within the specialty itself? Should a surgeon compare himself with other, other successful surgeons or should we, should we learn to live within ourselves, within our, our own resources? Well, Complications is an essential part of surgery. A surgeon who has no complications is not operating. Any surgeon who operates and has a volume of work has to have complications. And the important thing is to learn from your complications and make sure that you don't repeat them. The important thing about a complication is to take total responsibility for the complications. The buck has to stop with the surgeon. You don't blame the anesthetist, you don't blame the nurse, you don't blame the instrument, you don't blame the assistant, you don't blame the cautery machine. The buck has to, and when you take the responsibility, two things happen. One, you will make sure that you don't make the same complication again, because you analyze it and analyze it and analyze it. And you tell people, I make this complication. Don't hide it, don't put it under the carpet. And the second thing, if you take the buck for the complication, is you will get the total loyalty of your team. They will say that my boss takes the blame and I give him total loyalty. So it's good to learn from your complications. One of the worst complications, obviously, is death. There is no surgeon that I know of who has not had a death during their experience. And believe me, there are two people who suffer in a patient's death, almost as severely. The patient who has died and the surgeon. The trauma a surgeon undergoes when a patient dies, only the surgeon knows. He has to live with it and he has to overcome it. And it is a terrible moment. And this is why I think surgery 
is one of the supreme branches of medicine. It teaches you to give life, but it also traumatizes you when one in a million death occur. So you have to take your complications and learn from them. In terms of comparing to others, I think there's an old saying, comparisons are odious. You don't ever try to compare. No two human beings are the same. No two patients are the same. No two surgeons are the same. You see, today, people are a little, you know, it's like a little Bollywood, where some surgeons say that I'm so fast, I go 114 minutes. Speed is never an aim in surgery. Precision is the aim in surgery. Some people are born fast, they do fast surgery, that's an attribute God has given them. But for everybody to try and be fast for the sake of being fast is not right. Same way, don't compare yourself. You see, some surgeons do one procedure very well, some do another procedure very well. For example, I would take great pride in my hernia because I would train ultimately from the top authority in that. Or in the perhaps hepatobiliary surgeon, because I was for 30 years charge of hepatobiliary unit as a JJ. But that is not, you know, you don't compare. What you do is do what you think is best that you can do. You set your own goal, you set your own level of competence, you set your own aim and follow that. And your aim should be high so that you go on improving, increasing and doing better and better work. But comparing, I don't think, has set. Some surgeons might make much more money, you don't want to compare with that. Some surgeons may have far more patients, you don't want to compare with that. Some patients may be uh, very friendly with the other specialities, you don't want to compare with that. You do, you lead your life yourself. Each life is a life into itself. And your family, your surgery, your patients, all ultimately make for happiness. Ultimate aim of life is only one, to be happy in your family, in your work, and in your life. If you're happy with yourself, you're doing a good job. I don't know about you, but what I have heard in the last 40 minutes is like having life mantra. To be happy with yourself, to be happy to enjoy a surgery, is what, what is success. I think in last 40-45 minutes, Professor Edwardia has given the gist of, of a surgeon's successful life. I don't know whether this is ever taught in a medical school. We acquire it as we age, but when you hear a person who has been there, done that, it reinforces your confidence and it gives direction where we should be headed. I believe this interaction will be remembered by me for sure forever. And this should be of help to each one of you sitting at home, listening to this interview. Please save it because these kind of pulse of wisdom don't come easily. Professor Urwadia is one of those surgeons who have evolved from a, from a humble background to, to reach a pinnacle of surgery and still retain modesty to call himself a, a general surgeon. So I think uh, I wish to thank you, sir, thank you. for giving this time. And we are so happy to have you as our patron, mentor. We look forward to you. And I always say this, that people look at blessings from their seniors, but the seniors should know that you, your, your health and your well-being is because so many of us, the youngsters, not so young as I am, bless you with more happiness and health for a long time. Thank you. It was... Uh mind-blowing wisdom thank you Udvadiya, sir for continuing to guide us through 
thank you raman sir for uh, bringing out the best of wisdom from uh, professor udwadia in fact uh, udwadia sir had a longer uh, talk with us the entire talk will be uploaded shortly to the iags youtube channel we have many other aspects being discussed by dr udwadia please feel free to visit the iags uh, official youtube channel to watch the unedited version of professor udwadia's wisdom friends today is our first step towards this important uh, agenda of uh, listening to the legends legendary surgeons who have made legendary skills possible to the humanity i once again thank the opportunity given by the iags leadership professor raman sir for hosting this unique program and i am to inform this program will happen every fortnight we will have two legends speaking to us one on social parameters the other on important surgical technique please stay tuned to us we will be sharing the information about the next program the next program will happen on 13th september the second sunday of uh, september same time 9 to 10 allow us to settle down we would like to finish the program in one hour but then give us couple of weeks couple of programs so that we technically fit into the program please share your thoughts please share your comments so that we can improve from this on thank you iags thank you the surgical fraternity thank you the medical fraternity for staying back with us to this important event i look forward to see you all again in eight another edition thank you one and all good night to you